And, uh, you know, it's funny because like, like, uh, I've had buddies, if we're talking about the firstborn, I've had buddies where they're, they'll hit me up. I'm like, man, how's pregnancy going? And they're like, dude, I don't know. I don't know that I made the right choice. And I'm like, you're talking about your wife? And they're like, yeah. And they're like, is she crazy? And they're like, yeah, she's crazy. And I'm like, that's, you're right. You're right where you're supposed to be, man. Yeah, like, yeah. That well, is 100% yeah. par for the course, dude. This is pregnancy. <laughs> it's completely normal. Uh, it's something that, that other men should be telling you about. Like, yeah, they're absolutely crazy. And your job is to be the mountain energy and just to hold them through that, not to fix a damn thing, get them what they want adhere to their needs and just hold space for them. But that's, they're right where she needs to be. She's exactly where she needs to be. So thankfully I'd had a heads up around that. It was pretty calm. Kingsbury, back on the Dr. podcast. Uncle Doctor Nathan Riley. Uncle yeah. Doctor, <laughs> where did that name come from? Let's uh, give give people a brief introduction. <laughs> I think that's that's Bear there talking about you know what did I call him? He, he's so fascinated that you're a doctor, and he's like, do I kind of call him Doctor? And I was like, well, but he's but he's family, so we call him Uncle. You know, you gotta call him. You can call him Uncle Doctor. And he's like, I like yeah. that Uncle Doctor. <laughs> Uncle Doctor Nathan Riley. Yeah, yeah. I've uh, I've tended to you know, a couple of his little wounds and, um, you know, his scratchy spots, his like little fungal infections and the family has gotten together and, and, uh, we've helped out bear with his, with his, uh, adolescence, so to speak. Um, it's always a pleasure to go and visit you and Tosh. I, I consider you guys family and dear friends. I just feel like we're kind of like, there's like a, a partnership, a kinship there. And, um, something I, I always tell people is, Hey, you know, I'm going to be a dad. What, what, what do I need to know? And it's like, well, how much time do you have? Because this is not an easy topic. I don't think there's a lot of people out there that really model uh, fatherhood or even parenting in general for us. And fortunately, we have great women in our lives. You, you have Tosh. I have Stephanie. And they just happen to – like they've made a study out of this in a way. And they're very, very disciplined and very determined to, to kind of figure this out. But there's not really a guidebook as to how to be a dad or to be a mom for that matter. And so what I always tell people is, you know, one of the people in my life who I feel I love you dearly, Kyle, and I have no qualms to, you know, about saying that every time that I visit Kyle and Tosh and I'm there with them in their kids and just kind of being a fly on the wall, I'm really not a fly on the wall. I'm blowing bags. I'm helping with dishes. I'm trying to do my best. But watching you guys interact with your kids, I always come back feeling like a better man, a better dad, or at least with the ambitions of being better. And so that's what we're going to talk about today. I'm, I'm putting this course together, The Born Free Method, with a dear midwife friend of mine. And one of the units is going to be dedicated to the soon-to-be fathers whose partners are going to be giving birth. And, you know, we prepare for the day of birth. But then that goes by in a flash. And now you're left with this little person you have to keep alive. And you, have to, you have to also have to find a way to maintain your own identity. So this is not an easy thing, but a lot of us men are going through it. And a lot of us don't have modeling. So my first question for you, Kyle is when was it in your life that you felt like, oh yeah, I think I'm going to, I think I want to be a dad or did that ever come to you? Did it, or did it just kind of happen to you? Yeah. I mean, early on, I always knew that I wanted to have kids. Um, I had a high school or college sweetheart rather at Arizona state when I was playing football there, she played center for the basketball team and was six to 180 pounds. And I, I, I dreamt of naming my firstborn Her Hercules. I was like, we're going to create a fucking giant. <laughs> and, uh, be like you know, didn't work <laughs> yeah, it didn't work out there. Uh, did work out with my wife, Natasha. Been together for 12 years now. And, um, 
you know, when we were together, we knew we were going to have kids. We just didn't know. And we knew we wanted kids, um, but we took things slowly. We had both come out of really long six-year relationships that failed for various reasons. And um, we knew, like, we wanted to have fun. We didn't want to put that kind of pressure on it and be like, oh, this is what we're going to do. And we're soulmates and all these other things. And we allowed that to transpire naturally. Uh, plant medicines, as we'll dive into later, was a big piece of that. I remember having, um, you know, we, we go out to this Native American reservation and, and drink ayahuasca. And at the end, they have a closing circle. And Tosh was, was talking about her experience. And she said, I, I saw Kyle holding a baby and me holding Kyle and the baby. And I, I jerked in front of her. I was like, holy shit, uh, I've only read about this, but I had the exact same vision. And, um, you know, at that time, we were living in my mom's garage, um, I had just retired from the UFC and had, we'd been in my mom's garage for four years at that point. So it's not like, like we had, yeah. I didn't have medical insurance. I was working at a strip club twice a week, bouncing and bartending and managing. And, um, there wasn't a whole lot of, of boxes checked on my to-do list before becoming a dad that I would feel comfortable and ready for that. And, you know, the very next journey we went back to a couple months later, um, I had the same vision and except now I saw it was a boy. And in that, I had to grapple with all my fear around being a dad. And a lot of that took processing the way I was raised by my father and then moving through that uh, to see, you know, a lot of the, the, the fears that I had around being a dad were, were fallacies. They were constructs of what, you know, you've got to have this job and you've got to have the 401k and you've got to have all this other shit and then fully realizing and remembering. You have to get fence. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There's no perfect time to have a kid. No kids would be born if you waited until the perfect time. And, um, that's right. And then, and then in understanding that I had nothing to hide behind, I had no, nothing, no excuse to make, um, it really forced me to look at what kind of dad I want to be. And am I ready for that? And when I came to terms with being ready for that, that was the end of our journey. And a month later we were pregnant with bear. Wow. So Tosh, um, if you guys don't know Kyle and Tosh, just go to the Liv Living with the Kingsburys. That's K I N G B U R Y S. Check out their page. I know. I know Tosh. Close. Does K I N G S B U R Y. Oh, I'm sorry. I missed the letters. Yeah, it's a, it's there's a, two S's. Kingsbury. There we go. Kingsburys. <laughs> Kingsburys. <laughs> yeah. Um, go check them out on Instagram. They they post a lot of family photos. You guys are doing a lot of incredible things as a family, and. Um, you know, you've got your two kiddos. We're going to talk about each of those births, but I think the first one is always, you know, having two is way harder than having one. But when you're watching your person, in your case, Tosh, her body's changing, her belly's getting bigger. She's trying to do whatever she can to stay healthy, to keep this pregnancy as healthy as possible, because this little man, in your case, is going to you know, grow up and whatever we put into our bodies while we're pregnant, whatever we do in those early years, it's going to, it's going to imprint on them in a, in a certain way, both on the physical, uh, not just the physical, but the mental, emotional, and spiritual levels as well. So let's fast forward to when Tosh was, you know, late third trimester, she's about to have a baby. Tell me a little bit about what your um, fears were going into the birth and how did you, uh, not only get through those fears, but what did you ultimately decide was your role in supporting her, not only in pregnancy, but in birth itself? Yeah, that's, those are, those are big. I mean, I had had a couple of journeys, uh, with the plants mid pregnancy and that just laid all fears to rest around his health, uh, how he was going to show up and, um, connected me with him in a way with his soul. We knew it was going to be a boy. He told me his name was going to be bear. So there's, was this dialogue that I was having with him prior to his arrival, uh, prior to before even being pregnant, you know? So then like when we got pregnant, it was like, of course he's coming. We knew it was a boy. And then, you know, ultrasound later. Yeah, it's a boy. And it's like, of course it's a boy. But, um, I, we had looked into a lot of the different natural methods as it turns out when living in California and being dead broke, it would have been more expensive for us to, to have a home birth with a mm -hmm. midwife than it was to go to Stanford Children's Hospital. So just due to finances, we went to Stanford Children's Hospital and thankfully we had a great guy. You know, we had this printed out list like, Hey, uh, we're going to hold off on vaccination. We're going to do it at our own pace. We're going to do X, Y, and Z. We have our own vitamin K. We don't want anything sprayed in the eyes. And as you know, uh, that's an uphill battle, but all this was printed out and, um, 
he was really great. He was a young guy and he's like, Oh, I've heard more people are doing it this way. And, um, he's asked us why we weren't doing the home birth. And I just said, we, you know, cost of it. And, um, it's expensive. It's expensive. Yeah. 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 And really, really. And I'm happy we've done both, you know, cause we'll dive into wolf, but, but, um, really, I mean, I saw myself pulling him out. I saw myself fully engaged in the process. Um, I was with my wife at every, um, breathwork class that she was doing. We had a doula that my mom hooked up at Stanford that we'd go and see for eight weeks or something like that and just practice working on that. Um, I had already made, you know, I, I like to say that I get paid to learn <laughs> my job, you know, <laughs> regurgitating information that I've tried on for, uh, tried on and, and, and be, you know, have embodied, you know, then it's not just loose knowledge as Paul sure. Chick talks about, but sure. um, it's true embodied wisdom. And uh, a couple of the books that we came across, one was the Nursing Traditions Book of Baby and Child Care by Dr. Thomas Cowan and Sally Fallon Morell, head of the Weston A. Price Foundation, which I think I'm sure you've mentioned on your podcast before. Yeah. And that was instrumental. It was really good in really understanding what natural cycles to look out for, how mom's going to develop and change, and then uh, how the children change, right? It was based on a lot of Steiner's work, which you're diving into. And, um, and then uh, the other one was a book. I forget the name of it, but it but was by Lana and Dave Asprey. And, you know, say what you want about Dave Asprey and uh, his coffee beans and all that stuff. But he actually, there was a great amount of information in there that flowed with what we were understanding from the plant medicines. Number one, before ears are developed, they can still sense sound through vibration, right? So singing bowls, humming, talking to your children as early on as the first few days that your, your, your child is pregnant, starts to create a resonance and a communication line with them. And we were big into that. Um, just really setting the stage. We also stayed away from unnecessary ultrasounds, which, which would get them moving like, Oh, your kid's jumpy. It's like, yeah, you're fucking blasting him with sound right now. <laughs> like what the hell do you think he's going to do? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I feel like even though it was still done in a hospital, we had a, a really strong understanding of what we were trying to accomplish naturally. And we were able to do that. And, um, you know, as you caveat, like there's nothing wrong if you need to get C-section and all that. And, and uh, you know, some of our mentors have had to go that route, you know, having uh, older wives when, when they when they had their pregnancies. Um, but for us, we, you know, being younger, really wanted to do as best we could um, with the natural birth. And uh, yeah, it was it was great. We had she she I think we had wrecked or the car, the one car that we had had blown the engine. Um, weeks before. So my dad had to drive us in his F-150 and it's just a one, it's just one bench, right? So oh it's so great. Yeah. We're driving, we're in, stuck in traffic. We've been in, at my sister's house, like on a, on a stability ball, just doing breath work. I'm pounding Thai food uh, in between each, each contraction. And my dad was like, you know, it's okay. You know, whatever happens, it's pregnancy. It's okay. And she's like, I feel like I'm going to shit my pants. It's like, that's okay. You can shit your pants. Like, I don't want to shit my pants. You know, just screaming out of I was just dying. And, uh, you know, it's funny because like, like, uh, I've had buddies, if we're talking about the firstborn, I've had buddies where they're, they'll hit me up. I'm like, man, how's pregnancy going? And they're like, dude, I don't know. I don't know that I made the right choice. And I'm like, you're talking about your wife. And they're like, yeah. They're like, is she crazy? They're like, yeah, she's crazy. And I'm like, that's, you're right. You're right where you're supposed to be, man. Yeah, like, yeah. That well, is 100% yeah. par for the course, dude. This is pregnancy. <laughs> it's completely normal. Uh, it's something that, that other men should be telling you about. Like, yeah, they're absolutely crazy. And your job is to be the mountain energy and just to hold them through that, not to fix a damn thing, get them what they want adhere to their needs and just hold space for them. But that's, they're right where she needs to be. She's exactly where yeah. she needs to be. So Thankfully, I'd had a heads up around that and was pretty calm in the storm. Um, we got there and were sent home. She wasn't that far dilated. We got back at 10 p.m. and she was right about to pop. Uh, doctor came in. She delivered at 11.02. So wow, fairly cool. easy first first delivery, yeah. you know, where she was pushing and grinding. But but um, uh, she did such a fucking great job. And you know, he was down there, the doctor was down there. And right as he started to crown, he said, Kyle, get in here, you know, and it allowed me to help position wow. the shoulders and pull them up. And I was, remember just staring at him like, Oh, Oh my God. God. Yeah. <laughs> dude, I'm staring at him, hold him. And then, and then I could feel like everyone's eyes on me and I'm like, huh? And everyone's pointing, like hand her to mom. And I'm like, Oh yeah, that, that too. But, but wait, okay. I'll hand him over. So <laughs> hand him over to mom and no trouble latching or anything. Um, it was, 
you know, Stanford's a teaching hospital. So we got paired up in, in these kind of, um, two families to a room deal where there's like a curtain in between, like the walls of Jericho no separating the room. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, so right after Vera was born, we're in there and, um, there's only overhead lights. So every time they turn on the lights, these super bright, nasty led lights, uh, that would, that would light up the entire room. So they're only seeing them and then us like every 90 minutes, but every 45 minutes, the lights go on. So, I mean, it was, it was really bad. And this baby was crying and I felt all the compassion for them for, uh, you know, premature birth and not knowing what to expect with the health of their child. And then at the same time, it was like, this is fucked. I never want to experience this again. Uh, every nurse that came in started loading needles and sometimes my mom would wake up or I would wake up and be like, no, 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 check the list. We're not doing that right now. Like, Oh, uh, Oh, let me go get the doctor. And then they, you know, there'd be like this constant line of communication. Why not? And, um, even though, you know, wasn't as bad as some people's experiences, it, they're pretty much just programmed to do one thing, Yeah. you know? So, so as far as having a natural birth, it wasn't ideal in that sense. Um, but, but we made it work. You know, we did what was necessary. They also tried to keep us there for three days, which was utter nonsense. So, you know, without, I basically had to threaten to leave, like, Hey, I'm packing my shit and we're walking out of here just to get them to sign off and allow us to go. Mm. Um, which is just more, you know, yeah. they want to, they want to, they make money, you know, doing everything they can. And, and once you know, you've got a healthy kid, it's like, <laughs> what else are we doing here? Yeah, There's exactly. no other reason to be here anymore. I want to sleep in my own freaking bed. I don't want another kid next to me that I don't know. I don't want these nasty lights going on overhead. I want to, I want to eat real food, not this real crap food. that they're serving with seed oils, you know, um, all the things, but, um, yeah, it was, it was, uh, I feel fortunate, um, that we were able to do it the way that we wanted to do it. And at the same time, you know, I was going to make sure that whatever kid we had next, we could do it at the home. Yeah. And, and thinking back on that for anybody out there who is a soon to be first time dad, or maybe it's their second, but they don't feel like they really, um, they're still grappling maybe with, with their role in pregnancy and childbirth. And I think a lot of men, you know, as a, as a sort of, um, preclude to this, it would be, you know, it's like, I don't really have a role. I just kind of wait and then the baby comes out and then we take care of the baby or whatever. I had suspect that you are a lot more involved, even energetically in the process for anybody out there. Who's wondering what is the man's role in pregnancy, birth, postpartum? What is your role? You know, you can't feed them. You can't carry the baby. You can't give birth, but that doesn't mean you can't do anything. What was your role in the process? Yeah. I mean, you're, you're, you're their, their entire support system and they should have a doula in a perfect setting. You're going to have a doula. You're going to have a midwife. You're going to have all these other pieces and components that make up a team that's there to support. Uh, hopefully there's other family members like siblings that have had kids already, things like that. Um, my mom was great. You know, she, she, she paid for our, our breathing classes and really was, um, she was about it. And even though she was kind of uncertain around some of the natural methods regarding which medicines we give or not give our kids, you know, that was a, kind of a topic we had to really explore with her. She was open to it. Mm -hmm. And, um, so it helps to have that support system. But as far as I was concerned, like I've got friends, you know, that I trained with and fought in the UFC with who were like, fuck that. I'm going to be in the waiting room. <laughs> you know, I'm like, dude, you're missing out on a once space. in a lifetime, once yeah. in a lifetime experience. And, and the truth is, you know, even though that was my stance on it initially, it's kind of like plant medicines. It's not for everybody. If, if you're going to faint, or you can't be in a supporting role. If you know that about yourself, make sure all the other pieces are there and then yeah. get the fuck out. Right? Like don't pretend to be the thing that you're not. Um, and then at the same time, if, if you can get around the fact that you're going to see everything stretch, that you're going to see poop, that you're going to see all of these things that are completely natural to the game. If you can get around that, then being in, as involved as possible, it's, it's an amazing experience. You, you never get it anywhere else. You know, when I think like a lot of people will say the deepest plant medicine experience, you count on one hand, your children being born, you count on that same hand. Right. Um, and you could say the children are more important. The other thing is more important. Both of them are psychedelic experiences. They're both yeah. altered states of consciousness where we touch and tap into the divine and there's no other experience like it, you mm -hmm. know? So to miss that, I feel like we're missing such a key component. And you know that because you deal with birth and death, that it probably has a lot to do with us, you know, pulling away from both. We're pulling away from birth and we're pulling away from death. 
Um, but to reconnect ourselves to those things, that, that's such an intimate process that I, I've always wanted to be a part of that. I'll put it this way. My sister is my only sibling. She's a year younger than me. And for her first pregnancy, she had gained quite a bit of weight. She gained a hundred pounds and she was at Kaiser. So they had rotating doctors every trimester. She had a new doctor saying you're gaining too much weight. And uh, thankfully she's dropped quite a bit, but it was me and my brother-in-law in there ho hoisting a leg while they had the clamps on the head saying, we're going to C-section if we can't get this baby oh, out. Like forceps, the big salad tongs. Yeah, the salad oh, tongs. Man. And they yeah. went with a suction cup on the head, which gave uh -huh. him a cone head for like three uh -huh. weeks. But, uh -huh. um, you know, they had, they, they had a new doctor in trying it for the first time. And after a few tries, I was like, get this guy the F out of here now. And just looked at him firmly. And he was like, okay. And then the new guy got in and cause they're threatening. See, and you know, Kaiser's great. They did the least amount of C-sections because they have their own insurance, Yeah, which means they have to pay for everything they do. So they're not, they're, they're, oddly enough, they don't want a C-section, right? Um, that's where I so did that, my training, by the way, at Kaiser. I did all of my residency cool. training at Kaiser. And that model for that purpose actually does make sense. They want, they are desperate to get the C-section rates down. Yep. So if, if you have an option as to which hospital you give birth at, Kaiser is not the worst place to give birth, apart from the fact that there's 50 doctors rotating on call and probably about 12 to 20 residents. In my program, it was 20 residents um, who were going to be practicing their skills under the, the attending supervision. But that it makes it uh, much more procedural, you know, and checklisty as opposed to just somebody being there and holding space for you. So continue. Yeah, yeah, you know, that's and that's that's a point important piece to to point out. We, but yeah, I was right in there, you know, with my baby sister and uh, seeing the whole thing, um, talking in her ear. You got to push harder. You got to push harder. We're doing this. You can do this, and just really be in her corner, man, right there, three inches from her face, with that leg pinned as far as I could pin it, looking at my brother-in-law, like push harder, push harder, you know, drive the legs down so she can push harder. And, um, thankfully she's able to have him and her twins and every, you know, she's got four kids now. Um, wow, all of them have come, have come, uh, come naturally. So it's, it's been a really cool thing to be a part of. It's something that I would do for anyone I loved. Like I would mm -hmm. absolutely be in there and be right in the fold as much as they want me to be. Um, so it, it certainly was something, you know, with, with my wife where it just felt completely normal. There's no place I was going to be other than right there for her. And um, it does help. You, know, you might say like, oh, I've got work or something more important. You don't have shit that's more important than that. Don't, <laughs> don't, no fucking, fucking don't kid yourself, right? <laughs> don't fucking make excuses. Um, and and even, even when it comes to like, especially the classes, like you want to go there and understand what is the cadence that we're practicing? Because there's a million different types of breath work. There's a million different you know, orgasmic birth and this other stuff. Like whatever you guys are going to get in on, it pays for you to know the style so that you can remind them gently, this is how we're doing it. Even if you're not saying a damn word, you're just breathing in the cadence they need to breathe at, right? That can be enough to, to jog, oh, okay, this is, I'm going to match him. I'm going to match him and I'm going to go through with this and that's going to make it easier. And as I do that, that starts to help the pain dissipate and I can come back into this, into this rhythmic movement that's going to help the baby come out a lot yeah. easier. And so yeah. that, that really was something that I, I understood when I was in those classes, like I'm not missing a single one of these. And, um, we practiced together. We did a lot of things, uh, you know, building the oxytocin. They talk about that in both those books, sex, uh, holding a pet, walking squats, all these things can boost that. And, you know, I was down for sex all the way <laughs> like in the game. Like there was no point. It's funny when she first got pregnant, I was like, man, I've never been more attracted to pregnant women than in my life before. I was like, why do they have pregnancy porn? It's such a fucking weird fetish. And then like, yeah. while she's pregnant, I'm like, Oh, I get it now. I get it. Like every yeah. pregnant woman is fucking gorgeous. You are creating and carrying human life inside your body right now. Right. Two beings folded into one and nothing could be more attractive. Like it was just yeah. fucking awesome. Uh, so yeah, that was, that was one thing that changed for me during, <laughs> during pregnancy. Yeah. yeah I'm yeah. all in, you know, I'm a, I'm a never shied away from the things. I'm going to let's pause there for a second because during the Super Bowl halftime show, R Rihanna was performing while presumably pregnant. I mean, who knows and who really cares? But there was a lot of comments about like, oh, I don't want to see a pregnant lady on stage and this and that. When I see a pregnant woman dancing and shaking her ass and and like owning it and just proud and loud and like I'm pregnant, I'm beautiful. 
which was my wife in pregnancy. Like she was glowing. She her skin was extra soft. Her hair was extra curly. She had this beautiful bump growing my baby girl. We were having sex all the time. And I'm glad we did because we're going to talk about the transition into the postpartum period where your sex life does start to <laughs> yeah, become a little different. But uh, yeah, the, the, when, you, when you really love a person and you're watching them grow your baby and then you have sex while they're you know, still pregnant, it's the sex is actually incredible. Talk about like you know, divine union. I mean that is some of the best sex of our life. And I don't know if people realize that, you know, it's like we treat pregnant women as they're these brittle, fragile people. No, this is your warrior empress is standing in all of her glory for nine months. And you as the man, like the part of the rite of passage is, is, is bowing down in, in grace to, to what you're seeing in front of you. And the sex just reflects that. So anybody out there who's afraid of having sex with their pregnant wife, if you feel compelled, you guys – should really give it a shot. It is, uh, it is amazing. So I'm glad you, I'm glad you mentioned that. Cause I think that's an important piece. Yeah. The, one of the things on that too, like when I'm getting into Lana and Dave's book was we talk, you think about the epigenetic on off switches that are constantly reading the environment. And while the baby's growing in the womb, it's reading the mom's environment through everything it can right through, through sensory touch sound. It's reading it through the chemicals that are coming in through the placenta. It's reading, mom's neurochemistry is reading all these things. So if you're increasing oxytocin and these feel good dopamine receptors, all everything is switching on because your wife is orgasming, ho hopefully while you guys are, uh, you know, getting, getting going, um, that's coding your baby. And I'm not talking about the man's sperm coding the baby. I'm saying your wife's orgasm is the thing that is nourishing your child as it's being built. It's that's flipping right. on off switches for, for the epigenetics that are going to determine exactly how your baby feels, thinks, and operates when it comes out into the world. And right. in my opinion, I don't think there could be anything better for your child's development than more female orgasms during pregnancy. Like that is like high, high, high on the bucket list outside of like organ meat, the right omega threes, whatever she needs from a prenatal, you know, like those are all, that's right up there with that. Yeah. Yeah. Oh man, we could go, I, I could talk about that. I mean, you and I just on your, on our last uh, recording on your show, we talked quite a bit about the role of oxytocin. This is the love chemical guys. It governs over orgasm, that, that ejaculatory reflex for men, the full body experience for women, which I wish I could experience that sometime. Cause I'm sure it's so much different, even from our, our, our full climactic experience uh, as men. But you know, it governs over conception. It causes the sperm to come up towards the fallopian tubes. It governs over the fetal ejection reflex and all of the labor surges, the milk letdown, like that love hormone can be flooding your baby from, from point A to point B when you're now in the postpartum period, which we're going to get into next. Um, but yeah, I, I love that you're saying all this. I mean, you, you should be teaching OBGYN residents. Like you should be teaching people about this man. I'll hire you. You're my assistant and my bodyguard simultaneously. <laughs> <laughs> um, so let's let's talk about you know Bear is Bear is here in all of his glory. Bear is one of the most vivacious, lively, curious kids I've ever met. He's also a beautiful man. Like he's very kind. He has this beautiful, you know, Goldilocks hair. He's very sweet. He's very willing to have conversation. You know, you think he's way older than he is. So you guys have done a great job. But before that. You've got this baby at home. You've got a little baby boy who's now sleeping in this little bassinet thing, perhaps, or he's sleeping in bed with you, whatever. What was the hardest part for you as a dad in those first six weeks? And let me preface this by saying you are the human optimization guru in my experience. I mean, you know more about functional medicine than I do, and that says quite a bit. So, so how did you maintain your own identity, your own health, and simultaneously show up for Tosh and for Bear? Yeah, it's tough. There's a few, I mean, there's a few big points here. One, you know, we were in my mom's garage, which was a separate garage. It was effectively a studio, right? Um, I had my dad's uh, Sawzall, uh, an air conditioning unit in <laughs> the side of the, of, the, of the unit here. And it made sleep training really hard, right? He had a crib. He would stand and cry and point at the bed until I'd pick him up and pull him into bed with us. Wow. And 
and it made it almost non-existent. And so I started looking into different books on sleep and, you know, as with anything right now, you could find a hundred things that counter what I'm trying to say here or what you're trying to say. That's just the time we live in. Um, but a lot of these books from Dr. Sears and different people that came along that really trained a generation on the, the to-do um, were fairly new. There was nothing that stood the test of time when it comes to that. If we look back ancestrally, which I've done through diet and exercise and a lot of other things, as you have, um, quite a few indigenous people slept in the same room as their kids up until they left, up until they were 12, right? And they got their own TP with their partner. So thinking of it in this way, um, you know, sharing the same bed or being close in close proximity to one another was the norm for many millennia. And that shifted very abruptly into how we discipline, how we treat and how we, how we, you know, lock the kid in a room and let them find their own nurture. Uh, so, so understanding that it made more sense to us like, Hey, this is, this is challenging, but I think it's going to pay dividends. Um, one of my heroes in the plant medicine space, Dr. Gabra Mate had written a book with his son and another psychologist called hold on to your kids. And they talk about, you know, from birth all the way through adolescence and teenage years, really what that means. But a big part of that in the early years was literally sleeping with your kids. It's, it's, it's the not breaking that bond and allowing your kids to see you first as the first connection point in their life. And then after that, after that, that healthy attachment remains, then they can go out and be better people in the world. And, um, for us, that meant doing something that no one else we knew was doing, which was sleeping with our kids. And, um, we slept with bear. I would, I would get him next to me and then just put her on the, put him on the boob when he needed milk, as soon as he was done, I would pull him back off the boob and have him snuggle with me. So if he's kicking, I can absorb that and mom can actually sleep. And, you know, the first six weeks were nightmarish with the lack of sleep, you know, like they're, they're really tough. I, I uh, got a prescription for modafinil because I worked at the nightclub from 3.30 in the afternoon till 3.30 in the morning, twice a week. And thank God, I mean, it was, you think of like four hour work week with Tim Ferriss, I was working two days a week and I had five days off. That was a pretty good deal. It allowed me to spend a lot of time with my son. Um, we'd go out to Santa Cruz Beach Boardwalk and get in the water. You know, as, as early as six months old, I remember setting bear in the water and he would love it. And then I'd pick him up when the wave would come. And, you know, old women are looking at me like, that's child abuse because the water is so cold. It's in mid-January, you know, and I'm like, do you, do you see him right now? Like this kid is, is loving every second of it. Um, so it just allowed us to spend so much time together. And modafinil, you know, like that, I'm one of those things where it's like, you know, one foot in the ancestral living and one foot in the miracle of modern science. I don't recommend it for everybody, but for, for our firstborn, it really was something that really helped me to get through sleepless nights. And, um, you know, this fire I had never had was lit under my ass to be a provider. And it's funny, it's like different switches go on when you realize you're going to be a dad. And it, it did come on board as protector and provider a little bit when he was born. But the longer we stayed in that studio, the more the pressure started to build up against the walls of, I need to get the fuck out. I need to determine what I'm going to do in my life. And, you know, a series of synchronicities took place where I was able to start podcasting and move out. We moved out to Vegas for much cheaper cost of living. And I could drive to LA to do podcasts. And um, we were by Tasha's family. So we did that at about a year and three quarters. And at that point, um, we, we still shared our own bed and bear had his own bed. We put him on the floor. So you, you can see right behind me here, kind of the style that bed yeah. needs to be made, but it's just right on the floor. There's no box spring. And that allows kids to get in and out of bed easy. And then they they can walk over to my room and if they, or our room, and if they're out of bed, we're about to practice this with Wolfie right when they come in and get in bed and crawling. Oh, okay. It's okay, honey. Here, come here. I'm going to walk you back. And we just walk them back and then I'll spend the rest of the night with them in bed with them. And that seemed to work. It really worked with bear for a while. And then every now and then he'd spend the whole night in there alone. And I'd have my night with Tosh. It allowed us to be intimate again. It was probably the most important thing because at least in the beginning of the night, he would start off in his own room with me reading to him till he fell asleep. I could sneak back. We could connect physically. And then if he showed up a couple hours into the night, totally cool. I can go back and, and uh, sleep with him in his bed. Also, we gave him bigger beds. So they got, you know, she's, the wolf has a queen. She's two and a half years old. Bear had a queen at one years old, just so I can sleep comfortably next to them. But that's really what we did. And it is very different from, from, you know, what most people do. Uh, we are going to be practicing that again 
uh, with Wolf right now, even before we move into our new house, we're going to start moving all the this space. This office is going to be our master. And because there's three bedrooms upstairs, we're effectively going to make all of these rooms work so that the kids can remain upstairs with us. Amazing. Yeah. You guys have a pretty unique setup in your, your Austin house now, um, where you basically have multiple options for where people are going to feel most comfortable sleeping. And even if uncle Dr. Nathan comes into town, which I'll be out there getting some ink in uh, July. So I let you guys know way ahead and you're like, no problem. We got plenty of space. We just configure the sleeping arrangement in, in the right way. It doesn't have to be done a certain way in other words. And for those out there who are, who are, shuddering at the idea of co-sleeping we co-slept with both of our girls and um there's there's a certain awareness you get when there's a little kid in the bed you're not going to roll you know, i know i know it has happened but if you're obliterated drunk and everything else you're not going to notice rolling under your baby versus when your baby's right next to you it's almost like their smell like without even opening your eyes you know exactly where they are and of course they're kicking you in the neck and in the in the, in the balls and <laughs> you know they're they're letting you know they're there but um that that co sleeping experience, I think, is is uh, I think we're probably pretty unique in in the United States, or at least in the West, for this idea that co sleeping is bad and it's gonna, you know, um, lead to some sort of poor attachment or whatever else. I actually think quite the opposite. And if you're considering co sleeping, imagine you wake up in the morning, your beautiful queen is on one side of the bed, in between you is your little girl or your little boy. There is no better way to wake up in the morning. You don't need coffee. You just got your natural, your like, your, your, your endogenous dopamine just surges when you wake up and there's your little girl right there sleeping comfortably with her arms to the side and just making little bubble noises with her mouth. Like it is a really, really nice thing to wake up to. So, um, I have a pediatrician friend who's like, oh, we sleep trained at five weeks. We just did the, you know, the scream out method and like babies can do it. So we did that because we both work in this and that. And it's like, man, you missed out on the opportunity. It's not that there's a right or wrong way, but the opportunity to wake up next to your little kid, especially first time dads, it is a beautiful way to, uh, to start the whole, the whole journey into parenting, in my opinion. All right. So we'll, so, so you have a, a second kiddo, Wolfie. Um, the story around Wolfie's conception and everything and your role in her life is actually far more complex than maybe what meets the eye. Um, Wolfie is now approaching three. Is that right? Correct. Yeah. It should be three, oh. fourth of July. All right. So you had, you had bear back in roughly what? 2017, 20, oh, 2015. Right. And, um, he's turning seven. You guys seven. decide. It'll be eight. Oh, he's turning eight. This right. year, unless you're talking about when she was born. <laughs> he was five right, when right, she was right. born. Okay. okay, yeah. Um, so let's talk about let's talk about some of the relationship. Um, let's talk about your relationship with Tosh and what maybe changed after the birth of of Bear, and what then eventually led to the birth of your baby girl, Wolfie. Yeah. <laughs> it's funny watching you get clamored trying to bring this up. <laughs> uh, yeah, this is, this is, you know, everyone's life is a, is a detailed tapestry and you spin it exactly the way you want it to go. Um, and, and the uniqueness of our lives, I don't think is matched really by very many people on the planet. So I'll just, I'll just preface it with that. Um, I have felt a deep and strong connection, uh, to my altered states of consciousness, um, simply, you know, from, from the amount of reverence and respect and, and really the, the, the way to do to the way to work with these medicines. And there's been a number of times as with my son bear, where I've, I've kind of seen something, not kind of, I have seen what's going to happen ahead of time, like a premonition. Um, you could call it a, a self-fulfilled prophecy, things like that. But, um, both kids I saw ahead of time. Both, both of them told me their names and both of them told me their gender. And with Wolf, I had seen her in 2016 in an ayahuasca journey and was just flooded. I, I, I thought we were going to have a, uh, another boy and uh, it just flooded with this female energy and I started crying and I just felt her presence as this magnificent feminine being. And, and of course, she at that point didn't have a body. She was all the things, but um, 
her soul let me know that she was coming and she was going to be my little daughter and her name would be Wolf. And we kept trying and I kept getting messages that we weren't ready yet. Both kids have their own requirements. So if you look to, uh, if you, it, it, it's a stretch for some people in the West, but if you think of reincarnation and that our kids possibly could be selecting their parents based on what their soul needs, yeah, um, it actually makes sense. It made sense to me that her requirements were different than bears. And, um, at a point in 2018, I had a journey with, uh, quite a few of our friends who will remain nameless. And it was a very powerful journey with psilocybin and my wife had been talking, uh, my wife and I had been talking about opening our marriage and opening the relationship. And what I had seen there when I asked about Wolf was that sperm competition would be the actual way she would be born. And I was fucking floored. I had, my wife was right there with me and I was, I remember asking if she was saying the same thing I was saying. And the answer was no. Um, there was there was a lot that had to transpire. First and foremost, we weren't even doing open relationship at that point. So this was kind of a fucking hammer to drop. Hey, I think our next child is going to come potentially from another man's sperm. And I wasn't even ready for it at that point. Um, man, I didn't know what that meant. If it was going to come from open relationship, we had looked into adopting in central and South America. When, when bear was in the womb, I actually traveled. I spent a week in Costa Rica, a week in Panama, a week in Peru and a week in Colombia sometimes participating in the medicine, sometimes not looking, really looking for a place to, to move our kids. I had seen enough uh, from our government and it was only in experiencing the governments of third world countries where I realized as much as I want to complain, this is still the best place on earth to live. And, um, you know, but during that time we were looking at adopting and, and um, potentially because of how uh, it had just always, I have cousins that were adopted. It was always something that, that we had considered and, I began seeing her with brown eyes and brown hair. So in my visions, I was seeing her with brown eyes and brown hair, and I couldn't quite connect the dots. Once we started open relationship, that was kind of like a, whoa, okay, I hear you, but um, we'll see how things progress. And I had had a girlfriend for a couple of months and realized I don't want to practice polyamory. Like it's one thing to have extra partners. It's another thing to actually open up the doors to loving other people. And to me, it seemed like I was being stretched in too many directions, yeah. to put it plainly. And, and by the um, way, but, both you and Katosh have blue eyes. I just want to clarify that for everybody. So a brown eyed <laughs> baby would have been <laughs> anomalous. <laughs> to say the least. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, so we're, we were, I wanted it to be a two way street. I wanted her to, to, I wanted to experience all the pains and everything that she had gone through. It might be a weird thing to think about, but a lot of people that get into this thing, they don't think of it as a two way street. And for me, that was a very important thing. So I encouraged my wife to find someone to date and she found, uh, she found a guy that we are now very close with. And, um, for a while their relationship, you know, was rocky, but it worked because a lot of the needs she needed were being met by me as her primary partner. Mm. And over time, um, you know, I really started to think about that and how it had been four years, uh, of trying without any success and having her. And so I remember having the conversation with her about that, like, Hey, can he be a part of, of us trying together to, to create another life and to bring Wolf here? And the answer was yes. Obviously there was a lot of, of, uh, turmoil in making that decision and a lot of turmoil since making that decision. Um, mm. but that said, we all agreed to it and, uh, you know, she had her choice on genetics and, and she came with brown eyes and brown hair, just like I saw her. And it's been a, it is, you know, to say complicated is just a vast understatement, but at the mm -hmm. same time, it's beautiful because one of the, there's two things we really set out to do with open relationship. It wasn't contrary to what a lot of people think, you know, it's, yeah, you just want to get laid from other people. Um, for us, it really was about growth and, and increasing the, the unit of our tribe, like bringing people in that we could call family. And if you notice, we call a lot of people that were close to uncle and auntie because we want that increased tribe. We want to have the ability that, that, um, the ability for our, for our kids to be parented as well from others, you know, where really they have a large group of people that, that love them and care for them and are, are willing to look out for them and treat them as their own kids. And so, uh, Wolfie came, she came 4th of July on a full moon every planet. And I don't know, I don't understand astrology, but every planet was on one side 
of uh of with the moon opposite like they're all they're all on one half of a sphere yeah. and the moon's opposite on the full moon and um she you know that that to me again just shows like there is a divine timing to all things and um where we're born exactly how we're born and there's a lot of people you know that you could say like oh well so and so had this, their sixth kid and they eat like shit and they do whatever and it, 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 it's funny how that that remains true and at the same time there were more requirements for us i think than most people and at the same time i could not be happier with our situation knowing that that this little princess is here you know and that she is everything i could have asked for in our little girl um, and now she has two dads, you know, I had a vision of her writing a book, my two dads. So um, <laughs> she's got, she's got a, and I'm sure other people write that could write that for different reasons. Yeah, uh, totally sure. cool. But, um, yeah, we've, we've got, you know, one thing that helped was understanding, um, you know, legally, if you're married in Texas, it's, it's my child, no matter what. And that was something that was a big thing to look at. Um, oh, I didn't realize just in that. case things went, things, things went south, you know, but, but we can continue to remain, even though they're no longer in intimate relationship, we'll always be in relationship with him. And, um, he's poppy to her and I'm daddy and she's got, she's got both of us. So yeah. it's been, it's been a hell of a journey and, uh, certainly not one where, I mean, there's probably a lot of dudes right now. If there, if there are dudes listening to this right now, they're like, fucking, I can't, how, how, how did this happen? What, what, um, and it took a lot for me to get there. But at the same time, that continual, every time I've said yes to the things that have been required of me, it's panned out. It's panned out very well. Um, from moving to a new state where I didn't know anybody to, um, you know, everything in between. Like when I say yes to the, to the call, synchronicities line up and, and life is very beautiful. So I continue to say yes to that. And uh, life has been very beautiful with that yeah. experience. What were some of the... Um... Okay. So you find out, Tosh finds out she's pregnant. You already kind of get the sense there's a brown, brown hair, brown eye beauty growing inside of her belly. When it started, the wheels started to turn and you, you realized it probably was pretty quickly. Your gut even told you perhaps that, oh no, not, oh no, maybe, but I think in my gut, I get an, oh no. I don't know if that was like that for you, but what sort of emotions came up and how did you work through those emotions? You had nine months to prepare and then you, you got you know, 18 years to continue working through this, what were the emotions that came up and how did you work through that? Yeah, there was, I mean, there's a lot of emotions. One, um, if, if it's not my genetics, is she mine? Right. Mm. I think a lot of, a lot of, um, a lot of step parents might feel that way, you know? Um, but considering all of the necessary steps to orchestrate and make that actually happen, uh, I was the one really spearheading that to my wife and, and to, to Poppy and, um, really understanding the role that I played in, in bringing her here. I think it is a big one and it wouldn't have happened otherwise. And, uh, you know, there, there was, there's emotion around that in terms of like not knowing at the time where I stood, how I would fit in. Um, but then continuing to trust. Like this is the unfolding she's asking for. If she selects different DNA, still trust that that is the unfolding that she's selected as been shown to me through all of these journeys. Um, so really it took a lot of surrender. It took a lot of surrender and a lot of opening up my idea of what a family meant, you know, and, and a lot of people would be like, oh, you know, it's the destruction of the nuclear family. And, and, and sure. there is a lot of that right now happening where there is a destruction of the nuclear family through the demasculinization of men. Um, and many people will be rolling their eyes right now thinking that's the ultimate and demasculation of, of a man is to have another, another person's child. But for me, it wasn't that at all. And it was, it was bringing in more of the masculine and it was bringing in more of the ability to really have solid, uh, footing with the male interactions in her life, in her yeah. upbringing. Yeah. And, um, from the jump, you know, like I, we had a home birth and I pulled her out, you know, like I, I pulled her out, I held her, I set her there. And, um, you know, she's my little girl through and through and our, our, you know, she's Bear's sister through and through, you know, yeah. the, the yeah. genetic tie there of, of, you know, all the different genetic play is through the two of them, you know, and they're, they are family and they butt heads occasionally because the age difference. And as you know, through Steiner's work, every seven years, there's a big cycle change. Bear's going through that right now as he moves from seven to eight and she's, 
you know, two and three quarters, moving from two and three quarters to the terrible threes. <laughs> and so, you know, there's, there's a I'm ton of button right heads, but yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right. So it's, it's just funny. Cause like there, there's these, these stages, they're both entering very unique stages at the same time and they're absolutely incredible together. And what we've managed to accomplish is absolutely incredible in that there truly is extra love. There truly is more tribe. There truly is uh, a greater sense of, of holding one another and the ability for our kids to go and play and, and experience, you know, um, the farm at Poppy's house and get to do all that stuff that wouldn't be possible otherwise. And, uh, I think these connection points are just more of those connection points. It's not less. And, you know, it doesn't mean that, that it wasn't the hardest thing we've ever done. It, it absolutely was the hardest thing we've ever done. It's why we both opted out of being open or polyamorous. It doesn't mean that we might not choose to, to elect to participate in a fun experience at Burning Man or something like that, something unique and novel. Um, but it's, it's not on the radar, you know, it's, it's yeah. uh, in a way, in an odd way by, by, you know, if you love someone, let them go and see if they return or whatever that, 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 uh, old hokey cliche quote is in, in freeing ourselves of each other. It brought me back to her stronger than ever. It, and yeah. it, having other partners actually was the, the contrast I needed to actually see my wife fully and really appreciate everything about her. And what's cool is when you, if you do practice open, you know, and you have a primary or somebody that you're married to odds are, if they're a giver, no one's better in bed than your partner because yeah. you guys have the most experience together. You know, all the buttons to push in the best possible way. And, um, that, that was a really cool thing to understand. Like the grass is not greener. There could be somebody that's hot that I'm attracted to and the sex is going to suck in comparison to the sex yeah. of my wife. So many little things like there that I never would have even thought of entering into that experience. But you know, the main takeaway from that is that we've, we've never been closer. I've never been happier with her and I've never felt so solid in our, in our foundation. We, you know, we're together for living together for seven years before we even entertain the idea of opening up the relationship. So I think we had a really strong foundation to rely upon. We also had bear. So we were, we were pot committed in a sense, uh, to keep us through the, through the hard and challenging pieces. And, um, you know, it's not for everybody <laughs> at the yeah. same time. Like yeah. I have the ultimate gratitude and the ultimate respect for how challenging that was and, and how challenging it was for each of us. Yeah, I'll bring up, you know, Mark Gaffney's work, that book that you had recommended. When you recommend a book, Kyle, I'd go and download it immediately. <laughs> same, same. Um, same with you, buddy. Yeah, you, you have some great book recommendations. Mark Gaffney put together a masterclass that was con you know, sort of transformed into an audiobook through a Sounds True, and it's called The Erotic and the Holy, and he's a Hebrew mystic. I won't get too much into the story, but he talks about the three levels of Eros, the first being when you meet that hot chick at the bar and you <clears throat> have that incredible night of wild sex, it's not going to be like that every single day. And that's not cynical. That's just the reality of how Eros evolves as a relationship evolves. And when people reach that level two Eros, um, that's when things get hard. And many people go back and try to find the level one and they keep putting themselves through this, this insufferable cycle versus working through that level two to transcend to level three, which is when sexuality is fulfilled by love and not the other way around. For anybody who's out there thoughtful about polyamory and uh, am I just locked in with this one girl for the rest of my life? Like that's a, a childish way to look at it because the work that you put in with your partner actually serves you. There's not a zero sum game here. It just continues to feed itself and this love grows greater and deeper with time. I can't think of a greater test though of somebody in that level two Eros than now that you're raising another man's child genetically, but that she is your baby. That is a really, really hard thing. I think for people to wrap their, their heads around. So I appreciate you sharing. I know that this is a conversation that you, you don't seem to have any filters really, or, or, or a discernment necessarily in what you can or can't talk about, but I do appreciate you going there. Um, in this way, because you have such a, a roller coaster of a history with Tosh and, and just, you know, how all of this has, has become clear over time. Um, your first, the first birth, a bear was born in the hospital. Wolfie was born at home. Did you have any fears or apprehensions about having a baby at home? I did, you know, we, we had, we had a miscarriage in between and, um, in between bear and wolf's birth. And that really fucking fried me. You know, I, I don't think 
if you, if you're planning, really planning to have a kid, I don't, I don't hear a lot of men talking about how hard that is to go through for both the male and the female, but like really, you know, a lot of emphasis can be on mom as it should be. Right. Um, but it is incredibly hard. It was incredibly hard on me. And I wanted, you know, I mean, here I am four years diving into medicine journeys, many of which were just to make contact with her and just to see, you know, what report card do I have for myself? What do I need to fulfill to make sure that I can bring this soul here? And, um, you know, having, and a lot of that, a lot of medicine in those experiences was just surrender. It's not on your timeline, you know, like actually get back to doing the shit that you're into and follow Eros, follow your allurement and your desire and stop paying attention to this. It'll happen when it's supposed to. Yeah. Um, but that said, it was, it was, um, you know, a very long time in the making and circle me back on the question real quick. Uh, it was, it was really, you know, at fear, apprehension around having a baby at home. Right. So we, we had, we having the, the miscarriage. Um, I had a lot of fear there and actually, you know, one of my, <laughs> one of my largest journeys was with uh, quite a bit of psilocybin and, um, how much was it Kyle? actually 30, 30 grams of penis envy and, uh, which is a very strong mushroom strain. And, uh, that, that can be jarring if anybody knows about psilocybin, but a guy, Kalindi I was somebody that, that turned me on to that I, Y, I, um, and you know, only time I've experienced that I haven't, I haven't dipped my hand in the deep waters uh, again, but in that experience, I, I went through quite a few layers of my own personal hell. One of which was watching my wife explode, you know, the, the miscarriage where she dies in the process of miscarrying. And I really had to come to terms with that. You know, it was a visceral, one of the grossest, gnarliest fucking experiences of my life. And so, you know, like what, where was the positive in that? How was that for me? You know, when I look back on that experience, <clears throat> it felt complete because I understood that whatever fear that I have consciously or unconsciously, and that was a very conscious fear that's running in the background of my mind all day long. Even if my thought is on weightlifting or on raising my son or on anything else, that fear is still there. And it's, it's, it's like an app, you know, a background app that's just constantly taking juice from my body. And it wasn't until I actually surrendered that completely and was able to deal with blame and, and shame and all the things that Gaffney really dives into in his, in mm. his other work where I was able to come to full terms of that and just accept it the way that it is. Mm. Um, that was really, really hard. It took 30 grams for me to get that experience. You know, it took a fucking deep, deep, deep dive to really be okay. And actually viscerally say, cool, I'm cool with whatever happens. Um, oh, surrender that that's the word that sticks out to me. Surrender. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, there's a, I had a, had a real cool conversation after that experience with Duncan Trussell, who's a comedian and fellow psychonaut. And he goes, Oh yeah, that's like Dante's Inferno. It says on the sign there, abandon all trust or abandon all hope ye who enter here. And I was yeah. like, dude, I, I never read Dante's Inferno, but I remember that as kind of like the, you're fucked. You know? yeah. <laughs> like that, that's, that's, if you go to hell, you're fucked. Abandon all hope ye who enter here. When really that's the key code and the doorway through it. Like once you abandon hope of it changing and you accept what it is, then it actually moves and changes into something else. And so that experience moved from very conscious fears and unconscious fears. And then when it finished, I had, I had a, you know, the most challenging night of my life, but a very important one in which, you know, just like, um, a Christmas carol, you know, like he, he goes through the ghost of Christmas past Christmas, present Christmas future. And when he wakes up the next day, he's like, holy shit. I'm alive. It's Christmas day. Let's fucking go. What do I want to do now? And uh, it was the ultimate rebirth. Um, and I think that really helped me to, to come to terms with where she was at and just full trust, just to know yeah. full trust. Yeah. We have a backup plan. If we need it, we had an amazing midwife with the team, um, that came out to the house. Um, it was hands down a far better experience than going to the hospital. Um, they made the bed with two sheets and a plastic coat in between. So, Mom could go to go to the bathroom and they could pull the whole bed sheets off with the plastic and then you have a fresh sheets already there and ready to go. Um, we had all the amber bulbs and the low light music's on whatever, whatever we actually needed, uh, to make it more comfortable. That was all there. You know, the, the comfort level of being in our own home was something that was truly something like you, you can't match that in a hospital. It doesn't matter how nice the hospital is. It's never going to equate to the comfort of your own house. And had we, had it been necessary, we had a backup plan where, you know, um, a mile away from us was a hospital we could have drawn to. They were all on call and knew, Hey, there's a birth going on. Um, 
we may be showing up in need of a C-section. But thankfully, that wasn't the case. I mean, she, you know, the second one's always faster than the first. The midwives and the doulas were on both sides of the room. Uh, Poppy's behind her, you know, helping her breathe. My mom's in the same room on the same bed. And she gets up to squat next to me. And I see her crown. And the feeling went off right then. Like, it's now. And without a word, I looked at both of them like a head nod, like right now. And I stuck my arms under intuitively while I was looking at the midwife. And she shot into my hands. Yeah, and I caught her. Like, there was no, <laughs> she made the tiniest opening and the whole thing came out like that. And I was like, wow. thankfully I just intuited it and threw my hands out. Um, she was only a few inches off the floor anyways, in the, in the best squat known to man. So it's like, she wouldn't have, <laughs> she wouldn't have hit hard, but, um, yeah, catching her and holding her and then all the, you know, it'd, be, it'd been five years. So all the same feelings flooded me. Like, holy shit, you're alive. And then, holy shit, I have to keep you alive like that, that, that understanding as a father um, that I had forgotten in large part because Bear was five years old. Like right now I need to keep you alive. And that's the entire reasoning. For, that's the entire reason of my existence right now is just yeah. to keep you alive and to make sure you're safe. Yeah. Um, that was really, really, really fucking powerful. And more so than, than helping deliver Bear was actually being the only one there catching her and hanging her to mom and seeing uh, her little face, you know, after she was pushed through bruised up and blue take in her first breath and cry. We had our dog outside the door who is a Chihuahua and a Shih Tzu. He never howls cause he's a, he's a, just a barker. He bark, we barks all the damn time. And the second she let out her cry, he started howling. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Right at the door. It was like, he knew yeah. too, you know, it's pretty special. Beautiful brother. Well, I, I knew that this conversation was going to be rich. I, I have, a. Uh... Uh, so thank you for sharing all of that. It kind of, it's, it almost kind of choked me up a little bit thinking about our home birth just, you know, a little over a year ago and just how, um, when you're in your own space surrounded by only the people that you want there and you're really only being asked or, um, told to do certain things when you've kind of opened yourself to it, you know, like nobody's telling you this is how it's going to happen. They're all in service to you. It, it really is a, a very different experience. And you mentioned all the overhead lights and all the beeping and all the distractions and all the people coming in and out of the room, like none of that at home. So I'm glad that you got to have that uh, as your second birth experience. My final question for you, um, Kyle K. Actually, what provoked this question was a, um, a quote from Martine Prechtel's book, um, The Unlikely Piece at Kushumakik, who which was your most recent book recommendation, and I'm, I'm freaking loving it. The quote is, life is meant to be elegant, re elegantly run, not competitively won. And given that you are a former, uh, I mean, you've played sports your whole life, football, you're a UFC combatant, you are the walking embodiment of the warrior archetype when people were, you know, see you across the street. My final question for you, given everything you've been through and all this, the work you've done on yourself and your relationships with your kids as a dad, I want to ask you, what is a man to you? Like, what is the role of a man? Mm. How can somebody embody masculinity to its fullest? Yeah, it's, it's, it's a, <laughs> it could be a whole podcast in and of itself. Oh, um, I know. <laughs> to, be, to be clear, it's not something where it's, it's concrete. You know, we can describe the different attributes of the divine masculine. And, and we're talking about, if I use a term like the divine masculine, divine feminine, shadow masculine, shadow feminine, that's more like an archetypical nature, right? Like nobody, nobody is the walking embodiment of these things. Maybe Christ and Buddha were, um, and, and, you know, even though biology is a real thing, we still inhabit both masculine and feminine qualities within us. And, and hopefully they're both in divine accordance and not in the shadow accordance. Um, those take a lot of work. What is a man? I think, I think, the best book that helped me to really grapple with these concepts was King Warrior, Magician Lover. Mm -hmm. um, just a fantastic book. And it's understanding these archetypes and how they play into one another. And also understanding, you know, where we're at in history where most young men have no fucking idea what it means to be a man. Um, you got cancel culture and people taking shots at each other. I've had people be like, oh, you, you, all you Rogan wannabes go out and hunt and think that's manly to kill an animal. Or you think that it's uh, manly to lift weights and do all this shit. That's all fake, you know? And it's like, uh, clearly you don't hunt, you don't lift weights. You've never been in a fight before. 
and you don't really know yourself. You, you know the thing you don't want to be. The thing you don't want to be is a dominating asshole patriarchy style right. shadow king or shadow warrior, right? We've all seen enough shadow warriors and shadow kings to point that out and say, don't do that. What we haven't seen is the divine warrior and the divine king. And I think that King Warrior Magician Lover puts such a beautiful perspective on these archetypes that are inherent in all of us. Even as a woman, if you wanted to read that to understand men better, it would help. But you can substitute warrior for warrioress you can, or huntress, right? You can substitute king for queen. And all this shit still applies to the feminine as well. Yeah. And really, really understanding what is, what is the way where I find my center and then truly know like what's guiding me. What are the boundaries I need to set up for myself? What kind of discipline do I need as a warrior? And how do I balance that with the lover? Because a warrior without love, it's, it's unsustainable in practice, right? Yeah. And if I love without discipline, that can create shadow lover stuff where I'm the mm -hmm. Don Juan and I want to fuck everything. Casanova archetype. It could be the addict that's constantly searching for the next high or the next bliss out at, at an ecstasy party, whatever that thing yeah. is. Dependency, attachment disorders. Yeah. It's, yeah. It's yeah. understanding how these things really, really show up, you know, and cross, cross pattern to balance one another and, and help us remember what is the best version of masculinity? What is the best version of femininity that I can, that I can embody? And that's an ongoing conversation I have with myself. Mm -hmm. It's not something that's set in stone. Um, I make mistakes as all dads do, you know, I, I, we spanked bear early on. It didn't work, even though we had talked about never doing that. And you're like, kid spits in your face and you're like, ah, you know, and they're like, well, that, that still didn't work. Let's talk about why the spit didn't work and why, why that was so aggravating. And, and, uh, I didn't mention any of the books that have really helped us. I mentioned one from Gabor Mate, hold on to your kids, but the soul of discipline is a fantastic book. And even if you're not into to reading these books, like my wife does most of the parental reading and gives me the cliff notes and I agree and, and practice. Um, there is a cool little Instagram uh, video I'll send you if you want to include it from um, a, a kid's doctor, basically. And he says, there's two things that should govern a parent. One, firmness. Mm. Two, kindness. Mm. Right? Be firm, but be kind. Don't belittle them when they make a mistake. And I've, I've, again, I've been on all sides of the spectrum here, so I've seen it, what works and what doesn't work. Um, but being firm and being kind. And, and if you think about it, and this is one of the ways that I think about it. He, he used the same analogy. Who was your favorite coach? Your favorite coach was somebody that recognized the things you did well, recognition, and then pointed out the things you were doing incorrectly, kindly, right? They didn't belittle you. They didn't, they didn't not recognize what you were doing well and only focus on the things that you're fucking up at. Uh, and belittle you for it. They recognize you got, you got recognition there in what you're doing good. And then in the things that you need improvement on, there's a kind way to do that. There's a kind way to improve that. That's always been me. I fucking, I've had every coach from football and I had the, the, <laughs> I had the worst coach in high school that would always talk shit and say, you're going to play junior college. You're never going to play D1. Just constantly talking shit to me. And, you know, I could see how that helps in some people's minds where it's like, F that guy, I'm going to do it anyways. That's not the kind of parent you want to be. It's not the kind of man you want to be. And even if you're not um, a kid, you know, or even if you're not a parent rather and don't have kids, we still show up in some of these archetypical roles in relationship, in relationship to our friends, in relationship with our boss, in relationship with our partners. And it helps to have that um, that understanding, that firm in your understanding of what what is the thing that you're trying to accomplish and kind in everything you do. And I think that applies a lot to the necessity of what men need to accomplish now. And, um, I know that's a very roundabout and vague way of answering the question, but I think that, you know, men are going to embody a King, a warrior, a magician, and a lover mm -hmm. and all that goes into those things. And the best men are going to have all of these pieces of themselves activated. They're also going to listen. They're going to have all of the feminine receiving aspects of quiet mind, stillness in the heart. And that takes feminine practices like meditation. It takes, uh, feminine practices, yin practices like yoga. It takes opening the body and not walking around stiff just from weightlifting and not doing yeah. anything else for yourself. It takes the last four doctors you'll ever need from our brother, Paul check. All of these things fold into that because, you know, as it turns out, what I put in my body from a food standpoint, that, that affects how I think, feel and operate in the world. How I move my body affects how I think, feel and operate in the world. If I'm not moving enough, if I'm moving too much, all of that contributes to overall the person that I present to the world. Yeah. And if I want to be a good man, 
I had better take care of myself first. You know, what we do with Aubrey and fit for services is, is this very concept. How do I become fit for service? That requires me filling my cup first each day with things that leave me more whole than when I started and are, are of a growth mind that contribute to my well being, so that my cup overflows into everything that I touch. God, it's like, uh, you are just so eloquent with your language. You capture it so well, Kyle. I thank you so much. I mean, this is why I say when I go to Austin, I, I usually stay with you guys and I always leave and I go back to my wife and I'm like, I just feel like a better man for being around Kyle and Tosh and just riding the wave with them. Cause it hasn't been easy in your household. I mean, for all the reasons we've described, but I mean, no kid is easy in the first however many years. I don't even know how long it's going to go on for, but, uh, 30. <laughs> yeah, right. Exactly. Exactly. I'm still a pain yeah. in the ass. So <laughs> yeah. When did I become an adult? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> dot, dot, dot. <laughs> um, Kyle, if people want to find you, um, just, you know, clarify where can people find you? What are you, uh, what are you working on? Yeah. At living with the Kingsbury's on Instagram. That's my, that's our family page at Kingsboo, K I N G S B U on Twitter. Uh, I'm there. I do respond to everybody that hits me up. I've got a decent following there, but, but not, not a lot of, uh, people reach out. I, I definitely get back to people on Twitter and, um, I'm at Kyle on Zion. That's a new app that's built on the blockchain. Uh, you own everything. No one can delete a post. No one can police you. Um, obviously if you're doing stuff that's illegal, that'll be policed. But for the most part, it, I think it's the future of social media and I'm at Kyle right there. Um, and we're, we're, you know, really what we're into is, is the podcast, Kyle Kingsbury podcast, uh, coaching people in fit for service and privately fit for service.com. You can find out everything that we're doing there. Uh, me, Aubrey, Eric Godsey, Caitlin, Howe. that that's kind of our, it's not kind of, that is our, our pride and joy. It is, it's the thing that we, we gave birth to four years ago. It's our fifth year now. And, um, it's where I get to teach everything I know and I get to interact with people and we're building community and, um, you know, there's a couple hundred people in it for the whole year. We're going to have them for the whole year. And we're still doing little immersives. I took uh, 30 people through the five day fasting mimicking diet with hot and cold, uh, every single day and mobility exercises every day. And my brother, Godzi, who's a union analyst, uh, got everyone into dream analysis and symbology, Jung symbology, as well as journaling practices, habit change and all that good stuff. So a lot of offerings there for one-offs. And then of course the year long, um, which we have a wait list for now since we're rocking and rolling into year five. And I think that is something that, that just truly lights me up because yeah. you know, fighting, fighting gave me a reason to learn more. If I didn't learn more, I was going to get my ass kicked. And so a lot of that was focused on performance and then finishing that longevity, how to heal the brain. Um, and now the, the spectrum is broadened, you know, because I have a group of people that are relying on me for, for some of the stuff that I talk about from health and wellness and, and many of the things that dive in deeper, how do we navigate relationships? How do we mm -hmm. navigate open? How do we navigate parenting? And so that, that to me is awesome because it keeps, it's a novel experience, right? It keeps unfolding. Yeah. It keeps changing. And, uh, there's no one set of how to do it. So I'm really excited to, to be able to continue to deep dive with people closely, either through fit for service or one-on-one. -on -one. I love you so much, man. Thank you. Thank you, brother, for coming here. And, um, uh, I can't wait for people to hear this episode. Yeah, brother. I love you so much. I can't wait to have you in town and I can't wait to see what, what beautiful artwork Heidi throws on your body. <laughs> That's right. I'm barring Kyle's, uh, tattoo artist and Tasha's tattoo artist for uh, a couple weeks in July. So yeah. And I'll, I'll probably be there to celebrate Wolfie's uh, third birthday too. That'll be incredible. Right, yeah. Brother. We'll have thousands of dollars of fireworks. So. <laughs> <laughs> It'll be great.